Welcome, everyone. Have you enjoyed the festival so far? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's so great to get together with patriots. Even patriots that come from other countries, longing for their own freedom in their countries, like from Japan, right? Welcome. Come on in. We're going to be hearing a welcome. We're going to be hearing a great presentation from Dr. Paul Williams about the threat of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism in our country. It's a very important topic for us to all be aware of. Well, we're pretty close to the time. I guess other people can come. I'm going to just take a moment. My name is David Kahn. I come from Florida. We had a great freedom rally there on uh, June 30th, just uh, 15 minutes from Stoneman Douglas High School. Uh, June 30th, and uh, next on our next rally, we're going to have to invite Dr. Williams. <laughs> I'm going to just uh, briefly go over his bio. Dr. Williams was born in 1944, although he looks like he's born in 1964. I don't know how he does it. it must 70, be the Irish blood. 74, David. 74, 70. Well, 30 years, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he's an American author and journalist and a consultant. He was also an adjunct professor of Humanities and Philosophy at Wilkes University and the University of Scranton. Dr. Williams received his Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Wilkes University and Master of Divinity degree from Drew University and a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Drew. His dissertation based on Latin texts was on the moral philosophy of Peter Abelard. Born and raised Roman Catholic, Williams is a descendant of a family of Irish coal miners in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's a local. He began his career by writing articles on Catholicism for the National Review and serving as the senior editor for the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars. His first book, Everything You Always Want to Know About the Catholic Church Who Were Afraid to Ask for Fear of Excommunication, was published by Doubleday in 1989. So he's obviously not a controversial kind of guy. In the Day of Islam, his other book, he's written many, the Annihilation of America in the Western World, he expands on the American Hiroshima scenario he believes to be imminent, in which simultaneous nuclear attacks on seven to ten American cities would create havoc in American society. Many of his writings are considered controversial, raising questions in the Vatican, the CIA, and even the Mafia. Williams remained divine, saying, I love them for coming after us. At the end of the day, these people are going to be bloody because of what I'm saying is true. Come on in, uh, sit down, we have seats in the front. We're going to scoot in the front, we have space. Williams is the only journalist to capture the three first place Keystone Press Awards in three different categories in the same year. He has penned articles for major news outlets, including USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, National Review, and he's also appeared on Fox News, NPR, and MSNBC and penned articles concerning Islamic paramilitary compounds that he says have been established throughout the country. In 2010, he was quoted as saying he had become a pariah in the publishing world. With the fake news, that's a good, that's a good uh, name to be given, right? Uh, however, he remains a popular speaker on the Christian circuit. Dr. Williams also co-authored, co excuse me, he also co-authored the Killing of Uncle Sam, which took a well-documented look at the Anglo-American alliance after the Civil War right into the 21st century. If you haven't read the book, it's an amazing book, Killing Uncle Sam. And uh, with that said, I'd like you to stand and let's give a warm round of applause for Dr. Paul Williams. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> I hope that, uh, I really hope that some, I worked for the FBI for years, and I do hope that somebody from the Bureau is here to arrest me this morning, or this afternoon. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> this is a bulletin that came out from the FBI. <clears throat> it was circulated to all the agents, <clears throat> and it's called an intelligence bulletin. It was circulated in May of this year, and it said this, that anyone 
who speaks to you about a place called Islam and says that it's a threat, it's a domestic terrorist. I am a domestic terrorist, okay? I'm a domestic terrorist. What I'm, for what I am going to say to you this morning, according to this FBI bulletin, I should be taken under arrest. Okay? No, I'm fine. <clears throat> so having said that, let me tell you this. Another thing this, this bulletin from the FBI says is that anybody who says that the United States is being governed by a money cartel, a cobble of uh, influential people who are manipulating world affairs is also spreading domestic terrorism. I've written many books on that same subject and I'm going to circulate the same teaching here today. Uh, <clears throat> to really speak uh, to you, you have to understand certain things about me because I'm, I'm, really going to tell, I'm really going to give you, I think, inside information that very few people are privy to. Uh, I have entered some of the most dangerous places in America. Uh, I have had a, a wonderful career as a journalist. Uh, several years ago, I wrote a, uh, a couple articles on McMaster University where uh, I, I uncovered a plot to kill the Prime Minister and to blow up Parliament. I was decorated in in, 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 uh, in Ontario, and at the same time, I was sued by the people at McMaster uh, for exposing the Islamic terrorists. I was sued for $12 million. Now, the thing is, when you're sued like this, and I've been sued many times throughout my life, I've always won, but you lose because you have to pay the lawyers. That's right. uh, I also spent a great deal of my career here. Uh, I had a newspaper uh, 25 years ago called The Metro that was sued regularly every week. And we wrote, I wrote constantly about it by a guy by the name of Louis de Naples, who owns the landfills here in northeastern Pennsylvania. Friends of de Naples, uh, including a, a state representative, hauled me into a warehouse in Pittston, Pennsylvania, and beat the daylights out of me. So I ended up in the Wilkesburg General Hospital. So I've been in dangerous places before. I, 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 I'm not somebody who gets information from the internet. I'm an old type reporter. I walk the beat, I go to the places, and I get the information. And the information I'm going to present to you today, you'll all see most of it is photographed. However, I have to say this. I had a whole series of photographs that were taken from my visits, my many visits to Islamburg and other compounds. Billy, you'll appreciate this, Billy David. Really, my entire life was on this computer. And I, I, I had one person enter my computer one afternoon and, and hit certain keys and everything on that computer disappeared. This person should be hired by Hillary Clinton and this person is sitting right here and it's my wife, Pat. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go to Islamburg. Uh, I first went to Islamburg 14 years ago. And uh, I heard about it from several friends of mine. This is after 9-11, of course. And they said, uh, you should really go up there and take a look at this place. Uh, because what's taking place on Islamburg impacts national security. So I went there. This is, once again, about 14 years ago. Islamburg is located between Hancock and Deposit, New York. Do you know where that is, Billy? Yeah. It's in a very remote area. Uh, that's a welcoming sign. Uh, come on. That's right. This is very important. On the outskirts of, uh, before I went into Islamburg, there's a, a stand where mail, mailboxes, all the mailboxes for the residents are located. For a reporter, this is vital. 
the source of information. And the, my story about Islamburg would have been impossible to tell without locating this kiosk of mailboxes. Because by locating that, what did I find? You tell me. What did I find? Leads, addresses, identities. The names of everybody who was in there. Okay? The names of the inhabitants. So once I get that, especially in this day with the, with the internet, if these people have prison records or if they've been, you know, they, they, they've been bad characters, you're going to be able to find out about them instantaneously. So that's one of the first discoveries I made. I was there, by the way, with my, uh, there were only two of us. A guy who weighs about 350 pounds, his name is Patrick Walsh, but he, uh, he deserves a lot of credit. This is going down into Islamburg, even today. If you go down the road into Islamburg, it's very steep terrain, and it's gutted. You have to have, really, an all-wheel drive vehicle to go down there. Otherwise, you're going to really hurt your vehicle, which I did. I, I was driving my wife's car, and I kind of wrecked it by going up and down this, uh, the roads of Islamburg. Once you get down here, that's a sentry post. And the day, the, fir the first time I went there, uh, once again about 14 years ago, there were guards there with fully automatic weapons. And uh, they stopped me and they said, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, this looks like a quaint community I'd like to write about. And they said, well, you know, you're not allowed to enter here. This is for uh, Muslims only, it's the Islamic community. And they told me to go away. I didn't go away. If you go up about, from Islamburg, you go up Roots Creek Road, once again between Hancock and Deposit, New York. You're heading up toward a reservoir that services New York City, a massive reservoir. About, I'd say, a third of a mile away from Islamburg, that's where the reservoir is. I parked my car at the reservoir, and I went through the woods, which was, uh, there were no trespassing signs all over the place. I trespassed. Uh, the first thing I found there, I found out, once again, a lot of my photographs are missing, as, as I noted, but they, there was a firing range there. And the, what they were firing at that were not targets. They had, uh, they had a bevy of school buses. Now, you, you explain this to me. School buses. This is when I was on the Cavuto show. In fact, it's the only photograph I can take, I can, I can recover from my, this first trip. These school buses were riddled with, with bullets. School buses, okay? There were obstacle courses there. There were ropes hanging from trees. Uh, more importantly than that, there was a very, very large underground bunker, and it's still there. Uh, I would say it surpasses the size of any football field. And what's going on in the underground bunker is a lot of girl warfare training. Now, the reason I left, this is, once I took photographs of the obstacle course and the firing range, we saw some Muslim men heading up toward the firing range uh, with uh, camouflage outfits on and rifles. So my companion and I were forced to leave. On the outskirts of Islamburg, we noticed that there are little communities there are hundreds of people living there, hundreds of people there. All of them are, all of them are African American. All of them. Uh, they, they live in trailers. And the trailers all look like they were taken from some floodplain. They're covered with rust. Uh, a lot of them are not connected to a, a septic system. And the stench from Islamburg is unbelievable. Okay. I wanted to find out, nobody knew anything. You gotta realize, I'm going back 14 years ago. Nobody had written about this place or even knew this place was on the map. I was told by a private investigator. So I'm the first one that went up there and I actually took photographs. Well, I wanted to find out what was going on there. And this is just giving you an insight on what you do as a reporter. You have to get reliable information. I already had the names from the mailboxes, right? But where do you get reliable information in rural, Rural New York in Pennsylvania. Yes. A bar. You go to the bar. 
Okay? This is a bar in deposit uh, in New York. By the way, it's you can buy a, a pint of, bo uh, of beer there. This is for you guys who like to drink. You get a pint of beer there during the afternoon for a buck and a half. There were, there were about 25 people at the bar, and I started buying rounds. So naturally, I, I, I amassed quite a bit of information. What I discovered was that there, there's constant gunfire coming from Islamburg, explosives, that the people had complained to the local police, they had complained to the state police, and they had complained to the FBI, and nothing happened. One of the guys at the bar was a funeral director. Said, you know, there are bodies buried there at Islamburg. That uh, he has taken people who had died in the Hancock Hospital, transported the bodies to Islamburg. The people at the sentry post took the body and never returned it. He said, There's a graveyard there. He said, You could go up there. This is if the undertaker, the funeral director. And there's only one. You can guys you can find out just by going to the internet. There's only one funeral director in Hancock and Deposit. But what he told me was, you could go up there and you could get shot, and nobody would ever, ever find you. He said that the law enforcement authorities turn a blind eye, even though he complained that there are bodies buried there, and there's a standing army on U.S. soil. Any questions so far? was set up by a guy and, and, and owned by a guy by the name of Sheikh Mubarak Jalani. And uh, he's a very interesting character. He, he is a member of Tablighi Jamaat. They're, they're Muslim missionaries who want to spread the word about militant Islam in order for a massive international jihad to take place. Tablighi Jamaat. What happened, this is interesting, Billy will be interested in this, and David will too. In 1979, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, the CIA and the Carter administration at that time, and later the Reagan administration, uh, wanted the black Muslims in the United States to be radicalized and to be take part in the jihad. So what they did, once again, this, this is Tablighi Jamaat, Jelani, who set up Islamburg, along with Jelani and his friend, blind Sheikh Rahman, okay, who recently died in prison for the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. These guys were transported. I hope you're all listening to me because this is very important. They were, they were all trans, transported to the United States to radicalize the black Muslims in 1979 in a U.S. military transport. They were financed and sent here by the CIA. And what they did was they went to different mosques throughout the country, including this mosque that I visited several times. Like I said, my photographs are all gone, but this is a copy of, of, from one of my books. This is me at Jamaat al-Fukra. This mosque is called the, the most radical mosque in the United States. It's in Brooklyn on Atlantic Avenue. Uh, very, very interesting place. Uh, the 9-11 the, the operatives, some of them were affiliated with, with Jamaat al-Fukra. Uh, a, a lot of terrorist bombings and everything else generated from this place. This place, for those of you who are churchgoers, you should know this. This, and I did all the research on this, this mosque, this is just one mosque in Brooklyn, receives 2,000, excuse me, two million dollars a year in federal aid. Jelani preached there, and so did Blind Sheikh Rachman. Well, what they were doing is they were recruiting these militant black Muslims uh, 
Most of them were members of a street gang called Dar al Islam. And uh, after they were trained, they would send these people, they were sent by our government to Pakistan. In Pakistan, they received further training and they went into Afghanistan, okay, to fight with the Mujahideen against the Soviets. This is going on throughout the 1980s. Uh, <clears throat> But what they decided was, it was so expensive to transport these black Muslims from the United States. I'm going to talk about hundreds and hundreds of them who were recruited. It was so expensive to, to transport them for training in Pakistan that the government decided that it would be better to train them here on U.S. soil. So places like Islamburg came into being. Are you with me? They were set up by our government. Are you with me? What's going on here? Not only at Islamburg, but at different places throughout the United States, these camps were all set up, okay, to train people for the great jihad, Muslims, and it was all financed by our government. Wow. That's, are you with me? I mean, I'm not hearing anybody scream or anything else. Or, I mean, come on. It gets crazier. Once again, I've been at many of these sites, by the way. So the justification was, was uh, to fight against the Russians? Yeah. That was the beginning. But this this is the $64 question. This is why I was hoping, when I agreed to speak here, I, I my stipulation was that somebody from the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigation, the law enforcement agents, are here today to hear what I'm saying. This I know. Not only were, were, were these financed, and they're still all around this country, not only were they financed and set up by the CIA during the 1980s, during the Soviet-Afghan war, but they're still being financed by our government and supported by our government. How is that money through? We'll get to that in a second. Okay? you got to realize, <clears throat> once again, Many of these camps I've been to, and they're all the same. They all have obstacle courses. They're all firing, uh, 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 firing ranges. They all have inter, un, uh, underground bunkers. Every one of them. Now, the name of the organization, you, you guys should know this, that, that Jelani set up, that all these are operating under a, an organization called Jamaat al fukra It means Community of the Impoverished in Arabic. There's nothing impoverished about it, okay? But that's what they call it. In the United States, Shimano Fukra became known, they, they reincorporate Shimano Fukra as the Muslims of the Americas. It's a non-profit, tax-exempt organization. These people, not only are they say, uh, training for the jihad on these properties, not only is this activity going on, but they're not even paying tax. Okay, <clears throat> once again, this is after my first visit there, okay? Well, then I, di I discovered that Shimano Fukra, and this was, was my discovery, and it was probably, <clears throat> in, in my life, the most mind-shattering experience I've ever had. But <clears throat> this is my, a map that, that I drew up with a guy by the name of Michael Rash, who was a member of the Mossad. But all of these events, and I'm not going to go over them all, but during the 1980s and and in, in, in 1990s, Jamato Fukra, these camps, people from these camps, were involved in fire bombings, murders, mass assassinations, all throughout the country. More than 30 terror attacks on U.S. soil. And nothing happened. People would complain, complain about Islamburg, nobody would show up. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yeah. Shocking. 1990. I hope. I hope this is this is loosening your sphincter muscles, so you're cracking your pants because it should. Because this is what I'm telling you is really, really outrageous. In 1993, Rockman and members of Jamato Folk were, were involved in the bombing of the World Trade Center. Okay. Finally. In Buena, in Buena Vista, Colorado, and once again, 
nobody was drawing that this was my investigation. It started with the mailboxes that I saw there, okay? If I didn't get the mailboxes, I wouldn't really have known what was going on. And if I didn't go to that bar and find out more, I wouldn't have found out about Jelani and well, in any case. In Buena Vista, Colorado, one camp was finally raided by the local officials, probably by mistake. Mm -hmm. And what this is very telling. And what they found were <coughs> caches of weapons, fully automatic weapons, semi-automatic weapons, explosives, fake passports, okay? Fake uh, uh, licenses, fake social security cards, all in this one place. And once again, all these camps are interrelated. But after this raid and the confiscation of the weapons, really nothing happened. Then I decided after getting all this information that it was time to go back to Istanbul. This is my second visit. Maybe about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago. You notice that the sign has changed, okay? <clears throat> it's always important if you're an investigator to go there and have your picture taken, not because you're an egomaniac, because you have to do it because people won't really believe what you're telling them. During this time, this was on a Sunday afternoon, we drove down Muslim Lane and uh, the sentry, the sentry was not there. This was unbelievable. The sentry wasn't there at the post. We drove right up, right up the hill. These are, uh, this is one of the trailers, this is where they live. You can see, you can get an idea. They're not connected, once again, to septic systems. Now, even with the Board of Health, where the hell is the Board of Health in New York? They're not connected to septic systems. Most of them don't even have power. And these people, this, I'm not, when I tell you the stench was beyond description, I'm not, I mean, it's ineffable. Going further into uh, Islamburg, I just want you to know what, how, an, an idea how the community looked like. <clears throat> this is their general store. This place is called the uh, Islamic Open University that receives federal aid. Okay? You can go get a scholarship from the federal government to go to this place. This is their university. Christian, now, this is what, yeah. You get a scholarship as an American to go to that university? Yeah, 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 you get federal right. Yeah. Okay, this was my, my real find. It was with a guy by the name of Cal Walsh, once again, it was 350. We're there all, there are no men there. The men had all disappeared. So we're, I'm there on this day, and I find the graveyard. Voila, right? That's a freshly dug grave. The, the, the camp at that day, once again, these are our photographs. The camp that day was just inhabited by women. And when we finally could talk to, when we got to some women, we were saying, oh, we're doing this piece for life. Life magazine on religious communities throughout the United States. And a couple of them opened up to us and they said, Oh, all of our men are now in Pakistan. And a lot of the women now were not just African Americans from the inner cities, which they were during my first visit. Most of the women were Pakistani. Okay? They, you know, polygamy is very much alive and well in Islam. Now, along with that, in the woods, we noticed a lot of women who were training and carrying weapons. Now what's interesting about this and why I'm bringing up the weapons, almost all of the inhabitants, Amer um, um, uh, African Americans, and I got their names and I looked them up, almost all of them are felons, convicted felons. Who came right out of prison, he had converted to Islam in prison, go to Islamburg, and they're given weapons. Now, I think you guys know we, we are Second Amendment, and you're talking about Second Amendment rights. But this is going on, well, once again, I'm talking about a place that's like 20 minutes from here. 
I went back for more information. <clears throat> now, when I went back here, the uh, the residents of the bar said, "Oh, you know, so something something significant is happening because Islamburg is now expanding into Pennsylvania, and the the Muslims." bought this huge tract of land in Sherman, Pennsylvania. Do you know where Sherman is? Salemsburg? Sherman. Sherman. So I went to Sherman, and uh, sure enough, there were, there were plans to, to build another compound there. there were, but and the people, the neighbors, of course, were up in arms, they had called, because there were there were sounds of gunfire there, and you know the whole nine yards. But once again, nothing happened. But just in, 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 in case anybody is here from Pennsylvania and wondering if this is happening in our state, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> well, the stories I wrote about Islamburg uh, start to circulate throughout the country. And I appeared on Fox News, I appeared on MSNBC, I, appeared, I don't think there's a news outlet I didn't appear on, national news outlet I didn't appear on. Uh, I, was, I was many times on the Mike, Michael Savage show. Do you guys know Michael Savage? Yes. Okay. When I talked to Savage, uh, he said to me, what you're saying is, in, in, is unbelievable. They, there cannot be bodies buried in, in New York State. And this, the, the, this activity taking place without law enforcement officials intervening. I, he just always said to me on the air, I don't believe about the dead bodies. Well, fortunately, I had the list of all the names, right? So when I went for the names, a lot of them are on Facebook. And on the Facebook page of some residents of Islamburg, I got pictures of a funeral service, including the burial. So I sent that to Michael Savage. I also found on the Facebook page this picture of the underground bunkers. This was but one of my, I just went, I went to Islamburg, I went, keep, went there, went, came back, went there again. This time when I was, was there in the winter, the men were back. The men had been in Pakistan. And what were they doing in Pakistan now? Please, I want you guys to... What were they doing in Pakistan now? They were being trained here on our soil. They were being sent to Pakistan with our taxpayer money. In Pakistan, they were being trained to join the Taliban. Wow. Now, regarding Islam, if you, I, I'm not even hearing a scream here. You know, this, this is what gets me about American people. You can't shock them anymore. When I, when, when I came upon this discovery, I used to be a, a neoconservative Republican. Believe me, all of that is gone. All of that is gone. I used to like, you know, the Bushes, I believe the Reagan, all of that is gone. But I, th for me, this was completely light. This is, uh, this is Daniel Pearl. This is an idea how dangerous Jim Adolf Hooker was. Daniel Pearl was, was a uh, Wall Street Journal newspaper reporter who went to Pakistan to investigate Sheikh Jelani. Do you remember him? The guy that set everything up. What happened to Daniel Pearl? Does anyone remember? Lost his head. As soon as he, as he reached Jelani's headquarters, he's collared and beheaded. This is Jelani now. Do you remember the shoe bomber? Yeah, Richard yeah. Reed, do you remember yeah. him? Yeah. Member of Jamal al -Fukra. They say, oh, these people are nice, they're peaceful, okay? They're no, there's no danger. Do you remember these guys? Lee Malvo and uh, John Allen Mohammed. do you remember these guys? Shooting, yeah. shooting. DC yeah, the Beltway Snipers, hold up in a, in a Fulcher compound in Red Hot House, Virginia. Okay. <clears throat> Once again.
once again, Germano Fukra in the United States has, uh, at this uh, my rate, has conducted 35 terrorist bombings and terrorist activities throughout the United States, far more than Al Qaeda, far more than any other any other uh, terror group. It's not listed. Germano Fukra is not on the U.S. terror watch list, and uh, the Muslims of the Americas continues to operate as a tax exempt. Corporation. Can you talk this, about why? Why is not this? Uh, I'll, 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 last year, uh, a guy by the name of Ramadan Abdullah in Johnson City, New, 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 New York, uh, the local officials heard that he had a, a, a lot of weapons in his house. His place was raided. These weapons were confiscated, including with fully automatic weapons, including explosives all headed toward Islamburg. Oh, in addition, this guy, uh, Ramadan Abdullah, had uh, 50 bombs. Why? Why? You know, I, I wish I had the answer. Uh, I can only tell you what I found out as a, as a journalist, and uh, I showed you how I found out. Uh, I'm not a genius. It's, you know what, it, what I what I accomplished, anybody could have accomplished. Uh, I went to the FBI numerous times. Uh, I, I complained. I reported what I found. The only time the FBI went there, they finally went there after I was screaming about it and screaming about it. Do you know why they went there? To participate. To participate in a Muslim Boy Scout rally, but all the while, while uh, people in the country are speaking about confiscating your weapons, there has, there is, in my estimation, a plan afoot, and I don't know what it is, that something is going to happen on American soil very soon, and it's going to come probably from this organization, and. Uh, Saying that, I am, once again, a domestic terrorist. And at this stage in my life, I'm proud to be one. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Killing and raping 
is another event is going to happen that's going to uh, make 9-11 look like you know, a child's tale. I think more, more, more than likely, since there's been so much confiscation of nuclear material by Islamic groups here in the United States, including at McMaster University, that's what I was writing about, they've gained access to the university's reactor, the largest reactor for educational purposes in the Western Hemisphere, and the material was missing. I reported that. What I reported was true, but in Canada, truth is not a defense. So I'm immediately sued and shut down. That happened. That happened. Now, what is going to, do, what they're going to do with this material, you, you see material, nuclear material disappearing from food processing plants, you got to read between the lines, and something is going to happen in this country. I think it's going to be radiological. I think somebody's going to take a substance like cesium. This is so easy to do. Wrap it. Forget about uh, you know going through security. Wrap it around a firecracker. Set it off in Times Square. What would happen? What would happen? Anybody that's exposed to one grain of cesium, it's a bone sucker. You're gone. You're gone. Your insides are going to turn to mush. You're going to, and the buildings, any building that, that, that's hit by any particle of cesium, you can't scrape it off, you can't wash it off. That entire building has to be dismantled and taken to a dedicated landfill. I think, especially with these groups going on right now within this country, something is ready to happen. That's just me. I could be dead wrong, but I fervently believe it from what I've seen. And I think it's going to happen because you've got to, you've got to realize that uh, there's a surah in the Quran that says this, that if you want to attack your enemy, you have to be patient until you outpatience patience. That means the time when you least expect something to, ha to happen, that's when it will happen. Yes, sir? Is there anything we can do? Yeah. <clears throat> Even hearing me today say, I heard this guy, this, this guy, he showed pictures of Islamberg, called the FBI, say, why isn't anything being done? Why isn't anything being done? He showed pictures of the firing ranges there. He showed pictures of the cache of weapons confiscated from these camps. Why isn't anything being done? So the hope is that some agents, with their righteous, proper thinking, will push it forward. I think the more the more pressure, the more pressure that, that's applied, the better off we all are. On the FBI. On the FBI. On on, on, on government officials. On Congress. Congress, yes. Listen, I can tell you another story. I don't want to hold you up here. I didn't. This is a true story. I was in Brooklyn. We have 10 minutes. I was in Brooklyn in Bedford-Stuyvesant and at, at a mosque called Majid al-Taqwa. Al the, the imam of that mosque is Siraj Rahaj, okay, who is an unindicted co-conspirator of 9-11, Siraj Rahaj. When I went to his mosque, I was there with my cousin once again, and I was taking photographs. A group of Muslims, this is on the street in New York, grabbed us, took us into a basement. This is all gospel truth. And this is another lecture I could give you. I have the photographs. And <clears throat> the guy, the guy's name was Ali Kareem. I, when I was taken to the, to the basement, they said, take your shoes off. And we had to take our shoes off. There were, it was like a, a ninja nest of Muslims there. There had to be at least two dozen uh, radical Islamist in ninja uniforms. And Ali, none of them, I'm an American. On the street in America. They took me into this mosque, dragged me into the mosque, into the basement. Ali Kareem said to me, give me one reason why you're going to get out of here alive. This is in the United States, right? So once again, I use, you know, you have to lie as a reporter. That's how I get into it. I lie through my teeth. But I said, I'm here to do a piece on Siraj Wahaj because I'm a great admirer of his and I'm writing a book on religions of America and I'd be remiss if I missed him. So eventually I got out. Well, when I got out, a, a New York City detective by the name of David Casey, C-A-Y-C-E, -C -E, 
uh, got in touch with me. He said, you know, you just got out of the most dangerous place in the United States. How'd you get out? They didn't even go in. I mean, they knew where I was. I don't want to go into that, but uh, look it, I've been in, besides Islamburg, I, how about this? In Sellersburg, Pennsylvania, a guy by the name of Fatula Gula, who is wanted in Turkey, okay? Wanted in Turkey for crimes against humanity, who has established madrasas throughout this country, okay? Religious schools throughout this country. He's called one of the most, the, called the most dangerous Islamists on the planet. He lives in, in Sailorsburg. I was in his compound and took photographs of that. He has a standing army there. This is going on as we're speaking. But once again, nothing is done. Yes, sir. So, Paul, I, my, ask, my wife asked me the question, like, okay, so we know all this. Who do we reach out to? Do we reach out to a senator, a congressman? Because this this is just, and I know everything you're speaking of. I've been to Islamburg. I've driven past uh, Fatula Gulan's place. And Fatula Gulan was the guy that just tried to overthrow Erdogan. Yeah. Which they're both two radical, murdering, I guess, crimes against humanity. So... What do we do? Well, not only, let, let me just tell you one thing about Gula. And if I came back, I'd give you that. We were in there, I saw, I, 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 didn't, I didn't just go to the, to, I was in there. I, when I tell you I'm in the, put in the belly of the beast, I'm Irish. I was in there. I was in there and I saw what's taking place. It's on, well, there's an entire Turkish army in Sailorsburg. They hate your guts. They're armed to the teeth. This guy's called the most dangerous Muslim in the world. He doesn't live in Islamabad. He lives in San Salisbury, Pennsylvania. Come on. It's, unbel it's unbelievable. But it's all the government is, they talk about the deep state, but it's the truth. The government is being controlled by corporations and the corporations want the oil, they want the natural gas, they want the resources. The only way they can do that is by manipulating foreign affairs and manipulating politics and and manipulating the economy. That, that's going on. That's true. The corporations rule the country. And the bottom line is only profit. We want to get the resources so somebody else won't have them. Anything else? Or, are you guys ready to hang me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can ask one. What's that? I can ask one. Else, sure. See, that's a, a Trump mentioned that uh, how in the summer writing mentioned that the deep state. Is that uh, true existence? Deep state? You see, when, this is what I found out about the deep state. This, this <coughs> People think of the deep state, they think of a group of men just getting, you know, men with evil purposes just getting together you know, in places like the Council on Foreign Relations. That's not how it works. You have corporations. You have leading cor international corporations. They're no longer national. They're, they don't rely on, on, on the United States for their, for their uh, you know, for, for their resources, for the material, for their raw material. That's gathered all over the world. And the labor force is international right now. These are international corporations. They gather at different places throughout the year. Trade the, the, the World Trade Center, and they map out strategies. How are we going to get this oil? How are we going to get this natural gas? How are we going to promote green energy, which is our main thing right now? Because with that will come this massive carbon tax and massive profits. But that's how it takes place. It's corporations. And, you know, it, it, it just evolved that way. They're, they're all powerful. They control every aspect of our lives. Yeah. Are we talking about Russian collusion yet? How about Lukashenko and the plutonium center? Leptyshenko? Leptyshenko. This is very interesting. What happened to Leptyshenko uh, is you, you get, and this is how, how easy it is to mount a terror attack on, on, on U.S. soil. It really, it's, it's so, it's, the reason it hasn't happened yet is only some, you know, the good Lord is watching over America. Some, we're doing mighty good praying because, believe me, 
this, this is in the works. Once again, a material like, I said cesium, cesium is perfect. You know, you can put cesium in, in, in a salt shaker in, uh, uh, in major restaurant chains. Just say, sprinkle a little cesium in the salt shaker. You know what that would do? You have no idea what that would do because once again, you're taking it home, you know, uh, you're gonna you're, you're gonna spread it. You're gonna spread it through your fecal material. You're gonna spread it through your sneezing. You're gonna spread it through your pores to your family. And guess what? You have a major, major, major ep epidemic. It is so easy to create, but and that's what happened to Yevtushenko. When you talk about him, he was exposed to one little grain. Okay, and look at the way he died. His insides were all liquid. When they cut them open, all oh, liquid poured out. Everything had disintegrated. One grain. And look, like I told you, when I'm dealing with these people, even in Islamburg, they're armed. They're capable. They're not dumb. Okay, and they're being. They are being propped up. And unfortunately, I believe that the people who are facilitating them belong to our own government. Yeah. What What can the police do if they, you know, wanted to do something about Islamabad or Salisville or whatever? Well, you know, there's there's a group of wonderful motorcycle <coughs> there's a motorcycle uh, uh, caravan, and they were in contact with me who went up there, and. Uh, of course, they were denied access. But they, when they went up there to find out what was going on at Islamburg, uh, the people of Islamburg were protected by the state police. Wow. Look, the, the point about it is, if you don't do anything, if you there's a book called The Ten Drum by Guthe Grass, and in the, the book, this 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 this, midget, this, this kid who's, who's incapable of doing anything, he's seen the rise of the Third Reich. And the only thing that this kid can do is to beat his drum and scream. Even if you do that, you're doing something. You're doing something. But for those who do nothing, you're, you're worse than contemptible. Look at it. I, my wife will tell you, I have, I've lost, I've, this, this silly campaign I'm on, I've lost everything. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing I can take from me now. You know, it's, it's, once again, if you're dragged into courts of law and uh, you know the the, the the powers that be go, you might win, but you lose. But still, in all, you got to do it. I'm, I'm done. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, if you uh, expect, uh, you know, uh, about the most of the people, we expect uh, that something bad will happen to the United States. I come from Germany and uh, I watched it uh, through the immigration act for, uh, immigration act for the UN. Uh, they decided that uh, many millions of people from Africa and the Middle East uh, can, uh, can come into Europe, uh, mostly from Germany, and they have this Islamic, Islamic consciousness, and they are not good people. And so when, when when we expect that uh, some bad thing happened to, uh, to the United States, even more to Europe. Uh, the German people uh, become a le less in population and the Islamic people grow. And uh, the families, uh, we have uh, two children, they have eight children and come in and the young people come uh, over the Mediterranean Sea and uh, get uh, picked up by ships and come to Italy and then divide it, uh, divide the whole Western Europe. Uh, and the German decided we take uh, a fourth of this uh, uh, amount of people. They, they, they are in Germany and they already promised that they, uh, they were radical. They, they, uh, they, uh, they rape and murder, and the politicians say, "Oh, the, the, it's all uh, only uh, uh, single cases." 
is very dangerous. Okay? Very dangerous. And One final thing. Is there anything we can do to support what you do? Do you have a nonprofit? Do you have any uh, website or... Uh, See, that's what's so good. I'm not looking for money by it, guys. Uh, I don't, don't have anything to sell. I'm just... Uh, uh, I, I, I think you, if you're supporting Pastor Sean here, you're doing very good. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, you, you get a copy of his book, uh, but other than that, believe me, I, I don't have anything to pitch, anything to sell. If, if, I, if I can help you guys, if you have any event you want me to speak at, I'll be glad to do that. I, you know, I'm available, but uh, that's it. Okay.